Hello, everyone. I'm Raj Kumar, President and Editor-in-Chief of DevX, back with you for our continuing coverage of the UN General Assembly here at 76th General Assembly of the UN. I'm here in New York and I'm joined by Martin Griffiths, who is, of course, the UN's fairly new humanitarian chief. Uh, you lead OCHA. You've, I think, just started in the role in July or so, if, uh, if my memory serves. Yeah. And it's been quite a, a couple of months uh, in that role with so many new conflicts around the world, Tigray and Afghanistan now, and of course, joining right in the midst of a, of a major pandemic. So uh, thank you for taking the time to be with us uh, today. Pleasure. Pleasure. Very good to be here. Thanks. I thought I might just start, Martin, just by asking you a bit about um, this General Assembly and what you're hoping to get out of it as the UN's humanitarian chief. You know, what you're 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 going to be surrounded by heads of state, uh, some of them in person, many virtual. But what what is sort of the message that you're trying to to send to them? What from a humanitarian perspective, what does this UN General Assembly mean? I think there has never been a time like this, and therefore this week, when humanitarian action has not been has been as important and as often and easily misunderstood. So for example, uh, I was meeting with uh, the head of, uh, of government of one member state earlier today, who was saying to me, but really, why should we, how can I persuade my taxpayers to fund humanitarian assistance in Afghanistan when they are so uh, cranky and difficult, the Taliban, of course, in terms of the rights of women and girls. And, I, and I, we then had a long discussion about the basic tenets of humanitarian action and how it is intended to be unconditional. And that if we start making it conditional on matters which are, of course, important and of fundamental importance, like the rights of women and girls, then where will we end up? So I think for me this week, is an opportunity to hear from uh, people visiting uh, New York and virtually visiting New York as well, how they see humanitarian action going forward and possibly from my side to sh share some thoughts as well. Hey, you've been a humanitarian for a long time. You, you most recently were the envoy in Yemen. Uh, you have a lot of experience working in some of the most challenging conflict situations around the world. There has been a recent call I mean, not even so recent, but the drumbeat has gotten louder for reform mm -hmm. of the humanitarian system. We've written at DevX about, you know, is the humanitarian system broke, you know, merely broke or actually broken? I guess, what is your take as someone who's been in this space for a long time? Is the humanitarian system itself in need of substantial reform? Or is the issue really more just about getting more funding against the, the big challenges that exist today? I was in Ocha in 1998 when it was set up, 98, 97. Um, so I came back 20, 21 years later to Ocha, quite a different beast. Um, and there is no doubt that the humanitarian community, just like Ocha, has changed and transformed itself during that period. So as I look at it as somebody who was very much as an active operational humanitarian person 20, 25, 30 years ago, um, and now to see it where it is at the moment, the humanitarian work. Here's, here's my immediate take. First of all, it's much more professional. The assessment process, the planning process, the recruitment process, the issue, the, the norms and values and principles, lead agencies and cooperation and coordination, all of those issues in terms of humanitarian operations are a, a, you know, a light year different now than they were 20 years ago when it was a simple little village operation in comparison to what it now is. And of course, the money, the funds, the numbers are gone with it. So that is very different. But what is also the same is that we're still grappling with uh, what I see as the difficulties of two in two ways. One, can we predict the way a conflict is going to evolve and manage our programming to go along with those predictions? So for example, in uh, Ethiopia, uh, a conflict which is uh, gathering speed across the country and is no longer uh, centered only in Tigray. Where is it going and what does that mean for operational programs and funding and advocacy and staffing? How do we get ourselves in place to be ahead of the curve, to be able to respond? To make those predictions uh, requires a knowledge of the players, 
access to them, a sense of political context and where events are going, and basically good guesswork. These are, these are things which agencies so, uh, individually do quite a lot of work on, but as a community, perhaps less so. And so that's an area which I think requires a bit more thought. OCHA obviously has a big role. That's one. But there's a second, if I may. I started yeah. work many, many years ago as a development professional. And I'm very proud of that. I learned about this world that I'm still living in as a development professional. I learned about community empowerment and participation, things which the humanitarian world is much less uh, gifted at and capable of than the development world. I learned about accountability to local people through the development perspective. So when I also look at the humanitarian world now, I know two things. We need to look very seriously and in depth and carefully again at the relationship that we have with development actors. Not, not simply, by the way, from, from the perspective of Nexus so that we can leverage their, their money, but because we actually coexist in time. In Afghanistan, as you know, development issues coexist in time now with humanitarian issues and yet are subject to different elements of conditionality. The same is true in Syria. And in some ways, you can find it in, in, in Ethiopia. These are the three countries I've been visiting most recently. Mm -hmm. So the second aspect of reform is to see who are our partners in our efforts. And our partners do include development and do include those trying to make peace. I was, I was a political envoy, as you said, for the last three years. We need to understand where that's going. What, what are the prospects for Syria now, getting out of the incredible vines that keeps its people in the tragedy that they are? Where is that going? And how can we, yeah. as humanitarian actors, help that? So it's context I mean, as well as operations. I, I think it's a fascinating set of uh, perspectives that you bring, given your whole career and now coming into this role. And I just wonder, you know, one could say that the answer to those two issues, to being able to predict what's happening on the ground, understanding the context, and to integrating with development efforts is really to use more local actors. And of course, there's a big push to say the humanitarian sector still advantages big global institutions and isn't getting enough funding and authority to the local groups. Is that your take as well? And yeah. how do you see it now coming into this role after so many years, as you say, of being there in the beginning? when Ocho was first started. Well, I think that's really important. And what's fascinating to me, I had a meeting this morning with Ocho's donor support group. It's about 30 donors with whom we have a continuous relationship. This issue, localization as they call it, it was on all their agendas, on all their agendas. I came from an NGO uh, back in the day, ActionAid. 95% of ActionAid staff globally were, and I'm sure are, national staff. It was an international NGO, but an entirely local one. And actually, that was why it was quite good at its community development work. So, yes, we need to move towards that. And the, one of the difficult in the humanitarian world, one of the difficulties is humanitarian, humanitarian agencies are shifting a lot of money. Big programs are gazed on with great dis, uh, dismay if they don't do that quickly. So to, to, to localize, to understand what local people want, and to act in time are a lot of challenges. And they're different yep. for the humanitarian than for the development. One of the areas which I think is also very exciting, and it brings a lot of this together, um, is one that was championed by my predecessor, Mark Lowcock, is, is about what they call anticipatory action. And there is a growing interest in being able to predict and therefore respond early instead of late, and uh, with a focus on, on natural disasters and, and floods and and so forth. But again, look at Afghanistan. Um, I think all of us got it wrong as to what was going to happen in Afghanistan. But we could all have predicted that the Taliban were going to have a lead role in Afghanistan within a certain amount of time. Did we start talking to them early enough? Did we start uh, discussing them how this was going to go? On the whole, generally not. So. Anticipatory action looks like it's about uh, natural uh, disasters and floods, but it can also be applied to conflict as well. Not with such precision, but let's work on it. Uh, there's so much there I want to come back to, but maybe we can just dive into Afghanistan for a moment because you were there, was it a week or two ago now? 
you met with the with the Taliban. You had a meeting with uh, Mullah Baradar. Spoke yeah. with him very directly on these issues. Um, so a few questions about that because there's a lot of interest in the humanitarian and development community about what comes next. Some, I think, 70 percent of the budget of the, of the Afghani government comes from international aid. Much of that aid would go directly through the government to nurses and teachers. Have you figured out a workaround yet that allows donors to provide the funding needed for those teachers, those health centers, those nurses, without it going through the Taliban? That's a pretty key issue in continuing the aid. Have you solved it? Well, it's a, hu it's a huge issue, Roger, and you're absolutely right. Um, maintaining giving the salaries and maintaining the institutions of those frontline workers. Some people call it development. I call it basic services. And I say that has to happen whether you're in conflict or not. And if we don't keep those institutions alive, people in Afghanistan will vote with their feet. Um, IDPs want to go home. They won't go home if the schools and the clinics aren't working. They will stay in their camps. So getting salaries to those people is of primary importance. Now, the good news is that Afghanistan does have, with the help of the World Bank, in fact, experience in paying NGOs through NGOs and NGOs paying these frontline workers. And a, a similar arrangement that we see, by the way, in Syria, where you pay an NGO and they manage the, the payroll out to these, uh, these organizations. I think we're very, very close within days, I hope, of getting a, a temporary solution to, to that problem. But it'll be a temporary one, because here's the challenge humanitarian efforts in Afghanistan can be delivered directly through agencies and NGOs. They don't have to and they won't go through the Taliban to deliver. The same cannot be true of the wide variety of governance, infrastructure and, and services. But nobody is going to put money into the Taliban to do that, to, to invest in those basic uh, efforts for the people of Afghanistan unless the Taliban demonstrate that they're listening to the international community on the issues of rights, also, of course, counterterrorism. And we ain't there yet. We're still seeing a Taliban who made clear commitments to me on all of those issues, um, but, if, but are, if, let's, say, let's, let's put it kindly, are being slightly sort of uh, varied in implementation. The well, Taliban, and, you're in, and you're interlocutor in that conversation, Mullah at least mm -hmm. there's some reporting, maybe on the outs within his own government, uh, are you confident from the meetings you had with other Taliban officials that these kinds of sentiments go beyond him uh, and, and extend to the rest of the leadership there? Well, I, I don't think he's on the out. I think he's he's still, you know, a powerful deputy prime minister. But we're in touch with the prime minister, uh, so-called prime minister, with his deputy, Mullah Barada, with Sirajuddin Haqqani, the powerful interior minister. One of the meetings that we had in Kabul was with the Haqqanis. And, I, you know, I'm one of those who has a long history of engagement with our counties. You don't, you don't need to like them a lot, but you need to understand them and know them. And they have been uh, pretty helpful recently uh, in securing uh, routes of access for humanitarian operations. Um, but we, we, we're talking to those people on a daily basis. But I think the problem is that they, they make these commitments, but they're not being able to deliver on them. So that, that shocking... Uh, announcement of the other day about schools opening but only for boys was an, was an own goal, an unforced error, was a product of the ideology of the Taliban, which we keep being promised was yesterday and not today, but it's still there. So we've got to have what Filippo Grandi, the High Commissioner for Refugees, was saying to me today, we have to have patience, unfortunately, to work on these issues, to get to where we need to get to. If we don't what is have... Your I just want to ask you your message to the, the international NGO community, right? There are many international NGOs who have significant presence of Afghani staff, sometimes in the thousands, um, working in the country. And they've largely aligned with your call to say we need to stay and serve the people. Um, and their, their people want to do that. They want to stay. Do you have any message for those international NGOs that are operating there in this moment of uncertainty? What would you tell them to be doing now? I'm, I'm, I'm astonished, but perhaps I shouldn't be surprised by the courage of these people. And I, of course, I met their leaders in Kabul, but they're all over the country and they haven't left. And in particular, the national staff who are at grave risk and, and, and perhaps as importantly, are uncertain about their future. This is as corrosive as anything. So to these people, 
I say this, we've got written commitments from the Taliban, we, which are available. Anybody can have the copy of that letter and brandish it when, as is already the case, uh, the Taliban enter your offices, show them this letter. That's the first thing. This has worked on, on, in certain cases, but it's not enough. We're also working through our colleagues in Kabul to get IDs for drivers so that they will not be uh, stopped at, at the uh, NGO and UN agency drivers. Same for the staff. Let's have operating instructions which are clarified at local level. And if there are any problems, and there will be, but if there are any problems, tell us, tell our colleagues in Kabul, Ramiz Alakbarov, who is the humanitarian coordinator, and Ocha, who is working with him, needs to know when there are difficulties so we can act on them. But please, let's do this together. Share your information with us and insist that we share our information with you. That's very helpful and practical advice. We, we've run out of time, but I wanna maybe just ask one final question as we close, which is how you see your role now going forward. You know, the, the UN Humanitarian Chief is an interesting position where part of the job is being a bully pulpit, an advocate, you know, putting out there, pushing for pledges and pushing for more humanitarian action. And part of it is coordinating a very diverse international group of other actors in the humanitarian space. How do you see the balance of your role? What, what sort of humanitarian chief will you be? I think I'm probably going to be more on the, on the latter because that's where I come from. I mean, my humanitarian experience is operational. I started in Indochina, for God's sake, many, many years ago in the field, uh, in, 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 in the, the killing fields, actually, in 1979. So I see that as where I have a certain amount to offer. And it's that experience which I think enables me to engage, I hope, effectively with those principles, the Interagency Standing Committee. This is a community which it is an astonishing privilege and very rare, in fact, unique for a UN official to have a leading role for a whole community of this sort. That, that, that's quite, um, you know, it makes you sort of stop in the morning and wonder how you're going to manage it. But that's my main constituency and I'm here to serve them and to offer advice to them as to how to make their operations work better and easier and well-funded in the future. Well, I'm sure you know the, the community here at DevX, our audience, that message will be very re well received by them. Um, and I appreciate very much you taking the time, hopefully the first of many discussions that, I that we will so, have. Right. Thank you so much. Thank Wish you, you a wonderful you uh, and productive UNGA. Thank you so much.